from the East Coast, certainly it's, I think, the first weekend with good weather in a long time. So, you know, it's very nice of you to stick around. For those of you online, um, you know, thanks for joining us. And we're going to go with one more presentation from Al and I today. And this will be, you know, the sideways market approach, you know, to trading options. You know, we basically the stocks can do, it's one, to me, one of the great things about options and the market itself Stocks, indexes, ETFs, they can only do three things. They go up, they go down, they go sideways. You know, we talked about it a little bit. Try to find those option positions that work in each of those three scenarios and then go for it. So we're going to focus on sideways here. Um, you know, for those just joining online maybe for round three, the industry does put out that uh, disclaimer document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. There's actually a lot of good information in it. Um, keep it by your pillow if you're having trouble sleeping. It's a great, great way to get to sleep quick. But it does have a lot of good information. Uh, many of you are aware that OIC has been around for 25 years. Uh, quick history on why the OIC started. I think the industry does set itself apart with, you know, a nonprofit. You know, we everything is done, funded by the industry. We've been doing it for 25 years. One mission understanding the benefits and risks of the listed options product. So 25 years ago, turns out to be, you know, 1992. The genesis of OIC, you know, we know early on, the industry started in 73. Well, how many of us remember the 1987 crash? All right, I guarantee I did. <laughs> I mean, I was down on the floor and I didn't get this way, you know, all on October 19th, 1987, but a lot of it. And we remember how much the market was down that day, either in points or percentage, one day? Over 20%. I'm hearing over 20%. Anybody else? Okay, so 508 points, which in this day and age, that's a bit of a hiccup, but the Dow, Friday, whatever it was, the, the uh, 16th, the Dow had been down either 110 or 140 points. The Dow was only 2,300 then. Okay? We went down 508 points, 23%. How many of us are, you know, been riding the bull market, you know, selling cash secured puts? How many? Okay. Not too many, actually. But talk to me about the value of puts with the market down 23%. Ugh. You know? death. And, and that's where understanding risk comes into play. Back to the genesis of OIC, you know, the industry leaders and the industry at that point had only been around for 14 years. They said, we got to get out there to educate investors or we're not going to have a product. And lo and behold, it took a couple years, but it was, you know, the insanity of October 19th, 1987 that got industry leaders to get together. All the exchanges, fierce competitors, came together, threw in their cash, and OIC was founded. So that's a little bit of the history of OIC. And as I told you earlier, I've been lucky enough to be part of it for nine and a half years, Al for quite some time as well. And many of our colleagues, you know, Alicia, Alex are here today. And m many of you may speak to uh, our colleagues at Investor Services, Ed, Mark, and Bill. They are there five days a week for you. Another wonderful resource. You know, you can reach out to them through our website, and they're there five days a week for you. So we do all kinds of different things, and uh, it goes back to 1992. I talked about this at length earlier. Bottom line, for those of you, you know, maybe, you know, online who weren't here for round one, we're averaging right now about 21 million contracts a day. In 2018, over the last you know, half dozen years, that average has been between 16 and 17 million contracts, despite low, almost historically low, historic volatility. So if you throw volatility into the mix, option volume is going to grow. I frankly think the story of the last half dozen years is that option volumes didn't decrease with low volatility. And I think the reason for that is this room and our friends online, you know, investors are taking their portfolios into their own hands 
How do we protect? How do we generate income? The transparent listed options product is certainly a heck of a good way to do it. So we do have a question. Yes. Covered calls. I, yeah, I frankly have no idea. Um, I, I, I just I can't say. I, I don't know. Um, sorry. But, but I, I, what, the one comment I would say is I think the fact that volumes have stayed as strong as they have in a low volatility environment uh, suggests that there's an increased percentage of covered calls. But what that percentage is, I'm not sure. Uh, question is, how much of that volume is institutional? Very round numbers. My ballpark understanding, about 65% tends to be professional. About 35% retail is, you know, it's not a black and white number, but they're the percentages that I frequently heard. Anything to add there, Al? No, and you need to think that the institutional players coming into the marketplace um, with a 10,000 contract trade, and you and I are not that big. So, you know, there's where your disparity in the volume starts to come apart, um, you know, that percentage of, of the trade. I also think really quickly, my own feeling on it, too, is the, um, I'll use the word proliferation, but the creation, the innovative products that have come into the marketplace. We started off with puts and calls, and then the ETF marketplace came in, options on ETFs. We've had the weeklies, monthlies, options created to meet specific needs because, and again, with any of the products, index options or anything else, um, you know, it's a Darwinism type world. If I create an index and put it out there uh, and options on this index, but everybody looks at it and said, and an index doesn't really represent this particular industry, it will not trade. So there's been this really creative ability to put these products together primarily to mitigate risk, to allow people to mitigate risk across portfolios and stuff. So I think that's had a major play in the continued growth of the option business is because there's been more choices. So you and I on the retail side sometimes may want us to run from the room screaming with the choices, but it has been a good thing. One stat that I would add, okay, so we're, we're in the 21 million a day range. We have, we've mentioned weekly options just once or twice, not dwelling on them, but weekly options might be 30% of the average daily volume, okay? I mentioned earlier about 4,400 products, about 700 weekly products. Clearly the most liquid, but to Al's point, you know, the innovation of weeklies, which are only in the last half dozen years or so, a uh, big part of the options product as well. So uh, that's a little bit of the history. We've got the five parent companies, Chicago Board Options Exchange, NASDAQ, Box, MyAx, and New York Stock Exchange. So uh, now we, we've talked about risk. We've talked about income. We're going to talk about, you know, the sideways market. So Al's going to go through calendar spreads. I'll talk about diagonals. Uh, we'll, Al will get back to, now we talked about the iron condor, you know. Al prefers the iron butterfly. So he'll get into iron butterflies and then, you know, we'll kind of wrap it up. But uh, sideways market, you know, straightforward. You know, neither up nor down. So can we benefit with the listed options product, you know, when the market goes sideways? And, I, you know, as I mentioned, on June 27th, we're going to have, you know, the, the fundamental and technical analysis approaches to the market. I think it is that combination of especially technical analysis coupled with your favorite option strategies that, you know, can maximize, you know, your upside profit potential. Um, you know, another consideration, you know, how about volatility? You know, what are the levels of volatility? So, uh, you know, in a neutral forecast, if we think the market's going sideways, one choice could be, hey, let's just sell options. But for those of us, and most of us are in the option space, we know just selling options is generally not a viable strategy over the long term, net selling options. I mean, against the portfolio, in a spread, that's one thing. But just being naked short options uh, can really be a challenge. I think we have one question over here.
Okay, so a uh, very good question related to the brokers, you know, to sell iron condors and, and iron butterflies. What level of approval do you need with your broker? It depends. Just check, check out with your broker, okay? Yeah, just check with the broker, please. So um, other things, we actually haven't talked about really pin risk. I don't think we've mentioned it yet today. Something to be aware of, you know, if a call or a put or the underlying is a penny in the option in in the money rather at expiration that option is going to be exercised so that whole issue of pin risk is where proactive management comes into play we talked about that with the vertical spreads so just you know something else to be aware of so i think we will speak to uh the calendar spread and i'll turn it over to you Al. yes Okay, so just to further uh, on that last question about what level of approval, you know, be sure to check with the broker, and that is typically dictated by their compliance departments. Thank you. All right, thanks, Joe. There's so much information that you'd like to put out and thoughts to throw out there, particularly since we have an audience that is kind of balanced between people that are just getting started trading options and some people. Um, that have it, and Joe mentioned that famous pin risk term that you got to stare at and say, what in the world are they talking about? Let's just think about that, and Joe had mentioned earlier about the potential for early assignment on the options, that if you're short, the possibility of that having, happening is something that I think, once again, is part of your trading plan. You need to think about what if this would happen, and part of that thought process at least encompasses dividends in the underlying stock. If, if there's a large dividend and the price of the option is close enough to that, there will be people that will exercise to pull in that dividend because they can get the difference. It's primarily a large institutional play. You and I are not going to be able to do it. We don't move enough, at least most of us don't, I know I don't, enough stock to get involved in that. So. The overall concept in here with being aware of early exercise assignment, once again, goes back to your understanding of the underlying security that you're dealing with. Taking a look at, I'm going to put this three month trade on, full call spread, whatever we're looking at doing, a vertical, and we're going out for three months to do this trade. What's happening to that underlying stock inside that three months? Are they going to declare a dividend? Are earnings coming out at any time during that period? And then the next step, obviously, is what's expected. Because honest, you know as well as I do, in the stock market, expected and actual can have some very, very different results in what happens to the underlying security after those results are announced. So there's a few things out there like that, that, again, part of that trading plan research Besides just, I mean, I, you know, the fundamental technical analysis, it all rolls up into an overall picture to put you on the right path to look at a particular strategy to take advantage of that. But those what if scenarios are out there, dividends, earnings announcements, that sort of thing um, need to be something that you take into consideration. So with that in mind, let's go to a long calendar spread. We talked about the verticals going up and down within the strike prices in the same month on that. In this case, the time spread we're going to do, we're going to move calendar or time. You can see the, the framework either way. Same underlying, obviously we're going to do that. Different expiration dates, same strike prices. So the dates are going to be, we're going to go in time, we're going to go out. Time is money. The time value of the option, the further out you go, the more expensive the option contract will be solely because of the fact it has longer to live. Just that one factor alone will make, in most cases, the further out option more expensive than the close in option for that. Illustration real quick to see it, we're going vertical. Same strike price to January and in this case we go out to March. So we're in short dated, we go out we're selling the short dated, we're buying the long dated. 
what do we look, kind of intuitively when you look at this without going in? What do we? What what's the what's the objective in this in the in the basic long run? We're selling a short dated option. In selling a short dated option, what we really want to do is take advantage of that time decay scenario. So at that time decay in the option price, it's going to go down, and we'll be able to capture the time decay in a short term option. And that's take advantage of that. And then on the longer side, we're going to look out for changes in implied volatility and appreciation in the underlying, because now we're on the long side of the trade and we wish it to, to move in that direction. Now, and this is a call calendar spread. Real quick, particularly for the new people, the term implied volatility. Joe's talked about it. It doesn't, we're not covering it a lot in this presentation. There's a lot of great information on it at the OIC site. But just as a generalization to think about volatility, because we were talking about it with a high price stock and a lot of volatility in it. In the options world, the implied volatility is the means or moves the price of the option. And it moves both. Higher implied volatility doesn't mean that the call options are going up because the price of the stock has gone up. It means both of them are going up. It's a measure of risk, if you will, very quickly. So keep that in mind. In a low volatility environment, the option premiums will be both sides, calls and puts, on a lower range because there's less perceived risk in that underlying stock moving a considerable distance during a time frame. But if the volatility comes high, your premiums are going to go up. Why is it important? Because you know, in a high volatility in part, you might be looking to say, I need to put some protective puts on my portfolio at this point in time. Market's really volatile. It can, you know, can go crazy uh, on that. Just keep in mind that in that case, the put premiums are going to be somewhat higher in that case. It's like when you need it, the cost is the most. It's kind of like basic economics, I think, in that, in that matter. Okay? So, short-term price appreciation, <coughs> short-term neutral to bearish with this spread, with the calendar. Bearish, or we want it to stay the same because we want to capture the time value and the decline in the price of that near-term option that we sold. We have a long-term thing, so we need to have a little bit of a bullish outlook. So in this case, we look on the screen and we see that the XYZ85 calls with a 30% volatility is what we're looking at saying. These are priced with a 30% volatility included. The January 85s, $3 bid, 305 on the offer side. 85s, 5 bid, offered at 505. So we see these prices and we're going to take a look at what we want to do with this. We're going to balance, in this case, the time value sold with the debit at risk, because we're going to end up putting this on for a debit. Long, date, long dated is going to be more expensive than short dated. Okay, so we put this on for 205. As Joe has mentioned many, many times, that's the only number we care about at this point in time, is we got 205. We have the prices. Maximum gain, the shares close at 85 would be at the maximum, the short call expires worthless. Okay. In the long term, if the short call goes out like we'd like it to, and we get to keep the cash that we've taken in, we're now long a call, and basically the long call P&L is hopefully unlimited on the upside, at least for the life of the option. The maximum loss, the premium paid to put on the position. This, once again, if they're in the money or the share has gone down substantially, the share price has gone down substantially in that, or both options get in the money on the calendar. Remember, we're talking about an extreme move here. They get deep in the money. What was our forecast? We're neutral. It's a sideways market. So the trigger here for me is, is that once again, I'm starting to see some movement change in the market, the tenor of the market, if you will. I need to make some investment decisions. Things have changed. So I need to make some sort of investment decision 
with this particular arm. We're no longer in a sideways situation. What can I do? Yes, ma'am. Question. All right, in, in the marketplace, and, and Joe knows this real, really well, this would be the bid shown on the screen, price somebody's willing to pay for. The question is, what's the B and an A on these? So the bid would be what somebody's willing to pay. They posted a bid, say, I'll pay for you for these. Well, guess what? I'll sell them to 305. So the offer's at 305. So a real quick lesson there. I was a broker on the floor. Joe was a specialist on the floor. Um, and we're still friends after 87, by the way, because that was a... I was the broker trying to get executions. He was the market maker heading for the hills. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, so I would come into, and just a quick example. I come into the crowd, and I've got an order in my hand. And back in the 87 crash, everything was on paper. OK, it, I, the volume, this volume today, if we had to do it on paper, we'd all be dead. Uh, it was crazy. But back then, we still had papers, and it was still very crazy. But I had a paper order. I'd come into the crowd. And I'd say, XYZ, March 85 calls, how are they? And three bid, offered at 310. It's 305 on the screen, John. No, 305, 310 for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened in 87, by the way. That's the kind of day. Anyway, the baseline would be, as a broker, my answer would, would be, if that's his market, 3 to 310, I'd go 305 bid for 20. At 10. At 10. And I could either then say 305 bid, and that. B would change to 305, the A would stay at 310, maybe. And, <laughs> or I could say, take them, and we have a trade. It's done. It's done. So, but that's, that's what the B and A are. It's the bid and offer. It's just showing, it's just showing the, the screen. If you look on the screen, you'll see the same, same type thing. Now, why did you choose those two instead of the other ones? Instead of the longer days? Once again, Trying to minimize, minimize my risk that I'm exposed, if you will, on this. January to March, that's three months. I mean, that's, that's a good, good time period uh, for it. The, the answer to that is really in your analysis. Once again, you could sit back and say, well, what if I did the January, June? And keeping in mind, now all of a sudden, you've really expanded the opportunity for not good things to happen. Or good, or you could just do the June and sell leading up to it to add to income. Many variations on the theme, I suppose, is the answer. But in this case, as we said, I'm kind of time, time value sold versus at risk. This looked like a good three-month window to deal with. Can I add a little something on that? Um, you know, in terms of month selection, couple factors. Um, Obviously, earnings always comes into play. And if earnings, you know, is X month, chances are the premiums are higher because of the un uncertainty of the earnings announcement. So that's one factor. The other thing about the risk component, okay, that Al mentioned it, volatility. And this goes for all options. And a lot of this education is about option core concepts. With every option, the further you go out in time, you have more volatility risk. That's how it works, okay? That's for every option. So if you go buy June and sell Jan, you've got an increased debit, because time's gonna cost you more, but you also have more volatility risk because the June option has more volatility than the front month option. So they're just different factors in going into you know, what, what month maybe to choose. Well, at this point, we're not saying, and then the question is, do you want, does the broker automatically exercise that long call if you close it? You're going to have to take proactive action will be the answer to exercise the call. As Joe said, if it comes to expiration and the strike price is, and the share price, excuse me, is one penny in the, in the money, they will do it for you. It's an auto exercise thing. And that, that again, is part of that trading plan, do I want to do this 
What are my rights and obligations? And keeping in mind that one penny in the money will do it. If you take it on a basis, how much is your commission going to be to buy the stock? You're going to get it at 8501, but you're going to pay X number of dollars on the commission side. So it's kind of a thought process. And I, oh yeah, I'd like to, and which is fine, because you may want to add that stock to your portfolio. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Assignment and, and, and exercise in the options world are not evil. They're not the bad thing. You may set up your trade to do that. You could set it up with a put trade to buy the stock lower. Take in some cash to lower your basis cost on your stock, or, and then, hey, I'm okay taking it in. I got a, a question. We, the upcoming options uh, seminars about a technical and fundamental analysis. How many people in here utilize technical analysis, charting? Okay. Um, the way, reason I ask that is in a lot of seminars I've been asking about that lately question, and I found that the use of technical analysis has dramatically come down in the number of people uh, from that, and that's for whatever reason, but it is something to take a look at uh, for utilizing in stock prices. It's another tool, if you will, that's out there. Okay, let's see if we can get. Shares close below 85. The short call expires worthless. Keep the money. No stock position. Now we have a long call. So now our P&L drops into a long call. The reason for the bizarre chart here that doesn't have the usual straight lines is is because we're out in time and stuff, we're not exactly sure what the price of that is. Because volatility can change, we've had time value come down. We can estimate it, as we talked about before, by going into the options calculator and putting in some parameters. Always keep in mind that that is, in fact, a theoretical value for the option that said, given these inputs, it should be worth this. And we often will look at that and say, oh, it should be worth this, but it's trading at that. Why is that? Easiest way to answer that is economics, supply and demand. Joe can attest to that as, as, as a market maker. If I come in to buy the June 35s and there's three other people standing behind me to buy June 35 calls or yelling at him to buy June 35, chances are he's probably not going to sell all three of us June 35 calls at the same price because it's supply and demand. There's a demand out there. He has to mitigate his risk for somebody coming in to buy these calls. So in that case, you'll see it move up. So that's one of a potential reason that theoretical and actual could be different. Market conditions could have improved. The market could be up 75 points, 70, or 75. Talk about being an old guy. It used to be a lot. Uh, 700 points. Well, now all of a sudden the market has a different look, has a different volatility level to it. Your premiums are going to start to, to get out of line with, the vol you know, with theoretical. So, but it does give you a roadmap, and that's the key element to this. It gives you something to base expectations on. So if you use an option price calculator and put the various inputs in, you get a number, you change the inputs and you'll see a different number. At least you've got something to work with rather than taking a guess of what it might be. You've got something solid to deal with. question is, how do I incorporate open, open interest in volume? My feeling on, on that, and for those of you who are not familiar with the two terms, since we're on basics, option basics, I know we're getting them taking a little time here. I'll run through it. But volume, when you look on the screen, you'll see those two numbers. One will say open interest, and one will say volume. Volume literally is how much traded today. And it's updated dynamically as how many options trade today. Open interest is basically how many options are still alive that haven't been exercised or closed out. And that's, at the present time, updated at the end of the day. They take all the trades because remember when you go to put in a trade, you say I'm opening a position or I'm closing a position in options. That's a big difference for options orders to equity orders. So you could sell to close, you could sell to open a position. Think about it, opening, I'm creating a position. Sell to close, I'm eliminating it. I was long it, I sold it to close, I no longer have it. So the open interest reflects how many of those options have not been closed out. 
and it's one day later. It's updated at the end of the day on that. The, the, the thing, the importance of this is liquidity, is how much trading is in this option. Can I get in and can I get out for a reasonable or at a reasonable price level? And it's come up in some of the other things and stuff like that about trading particular underlyings. One thing I think that is important to do as part of your research is look and see how much stock trades on a basis and then when you look at the options, see where they are and prices. The less stock that's trading during the day, chances are the bid offer spreads will be wider than something that trades a lot and you just go look at SP, SPYs and stuff to see that type stuff. And very quickly, why is that scenario? This gentleman out there is taking a lot of risk across all the options. He needs to hedge his risk. How does he do that? Most of the time, he will take a stock position to offset the options position, meaning that he's dynamically buying and selling stock constantly during the course of the day. If the particular stock has low liquidity, it costs him more to hedge his position because he has to pay up or gets lower prices for his stock. How does he offset that a little bit? He opens his option premiums up. It's pure logic, it's pure risk management. He needs to stay in business, you need to make some money. It's just the way, the way of the world out there. But that's kind of a, an answer on, on liquidity and stuff. I would look at options with s decent liquidity and decent underlying trading because I know I can get in and get out at a price on that. So anyway, let me, let me roll through this and I'll take some questions. I got, we got kind of out of the way here, I apologize. Shares close above 85 on our calendar. We close out the short stock and hold the long call if we continue to be bullish, if our outlook stays bullish on that. Okay? So we, this would end up in a short stock. We close it out. Cost money, margin, all that stuff. Let's look at this before we get to this spot is my thought on this type thing. Additional capital may be required if we go through it. So... Taking a look at the calendar, it's another piece in the arsenal. It's good for the sideways markets. Time, prices, kind of our key element. How far do we want to go out? How far do we want to go this? And then we manage the trade and manage our expectations inside of it, our expectations for the market. So with that, I, I did have a couple questions down on this side. Anybody? Sir? Good, good question. We're talking about open interest and, and at volume. Is there a set number that you want to look at? It's really very hard to say that there's a, to give a, a parameter. I wouldn't want to do that. That's something you need to look at and balance that with looking at the option bid offer spreads. Saying, okay, this one trades 500,000 shares a day, for example, and the difference between the bid and offer is consistently 15 cents or something. Maybe that's too wide. Maybe it needs to have more stock. So it's, it's, it's really, again, a personal type thing, but I do recommend that you consider it as you look to do specific options trades. Um, if, could I just really do a real quick kind of bid offer thing? Think about it from this point of view, and this is kind of Joe's, Joe's arena here. But for you, we did the bid offer. Three bid offer to 310. 10 cents spread on the option. I come in and I need to buy this. I could bid 305 and he may go to 315 on that. But let's just say I go in and I buy it at 310. 10 cents spread, that's not all that much. But let's use that as an example. I buy it at 310. Where does this have to go for me to start making money on the option? At least to 310 at least at up to 310. So with that bid offer, I've got to have a movement in the underline that's going to move it up to at least that and hopefully higher during that time frame. So that's kind of what you're looking at as where do I want to go, you know, if I pay that 310, is this stock have enough, or the option, excuse me, have enough volume trading on a basis that it looks like it will have people interested if it goes up, we'll get to 310 or beyond. So, I don't know if, you know, from. so I, I will roll into diagonals, but uh, the whole liquidity issue, I, I couldn't agree more, is super critical. And 
you know, it's not just about, you know, it's twice. It's getting in and getting out. So if you're in an illiquid situation, you know, you got to be so darn right, you know, because if that bid offer spread, you know, if the pros and, you know, there's the mentality out there, and I do think it's unfair, it, oh, they know everything, you know, like I'm down on the floor for all those years. I know everything. Yeah, you know, I'll be retired in three years because every trade I make makes money. You know, it's gobbledygook. I was petrified when the big boys would come in and just buy calls, you know, by the thousands or tens of thousands. As Al said, I got to go hedge. All right. And generally, that's the underlying, because if they're buying the calls, chances are the calls are getting bought on all the exchanges at the same time. And I'm running for my life. So fear is a constant for investors like us and for the pros. But back to this liquidity issue, you know, you can analyze the open interest and the number of contracts trade. To me, as Al said, it is the width of that bid offer spread. That, that you know, that may change over time. You know, it may go from real narrow to real wide. That's generally not how it happens. When the bid offer spreads are tight, it implies there's open interest. You know, there's a lot of underlying trading. That's why the bid offer spreads are tight, because we can get a hedge. So I would say start there and kind of go from there. But remember, you know, it's not just about getting the position on. You got to take it off, too. So that liquidity thing is, is critically important. Uh, ro and, well, and Al mentioned it, but rolling from the calendar spread to a diagonal. Um, most of you aren't trading spreads. Does anybody do diagonals? Okay, we have, you know, at least one. But, you know, we're talking sideways here. <coughs> Excuse me. And diagonal is not exactly sideways. So I want to start by saying that. I wanted to get this in the presentation so we could, you know, think about another way to maybe take some credit out of the market. So let, let's get into it. Sideways. You know, I, and, and we're in the call space here. You know, you buy a longer dated call with a lower strike. So, you know, with our, our strike prices, we're in the money, at the money, or out of the money. So we're going to buy, you know, either an in the money or an at the money, and then sell either an at the money or an out of the money. Not the same month. Okay, these are different months. That's why, you know, as the slide suggests, it's a diagonal. In this example, we're buying the Jan 80 calls and we're selling the November 90s. All right. So buy Jan, sell November. You know, Al, you know, with the uh, calendar spread, you saw that P&L chart, that real sharp V right to the middle. Again, big, broad option concepts. When, when, when you put on a position, when you put on a position in a spread, you always, without failure, you want the stock at expiration to be at which strike? The long strike or the short strike at expiration? Without fail. Long strike or short strike at expiration? Come on. I hear long and short. You know, one of them's right. I'm, okay, short. Let's think about it. Again, conceptually, big picture. I'm long an option. I'm short an option. What goes against us in the options market? There's a finite life. Time. Bingo. Theta. If you're long options. Most of us use options. We know how darn painful it is when we, you know, buy a call, buy a put, do a spread, and nothing happens. Oh, well, sideways. So hopefully we've got a sideways position on. You know, most positions generally aren't necessarily for sideways. They have a bias, up or down. But it is that time premium that can kill us. So just then think about it. You got a long option position and a short option position. It doesn't matter calls or puts. It doesn't matter where the stock is. Of course, we want the stock to go to the short strike. 
no matter call or put, no matter the strategy, at expiration. How come? You get that premium, exactly, okay? As the stock goes to that short strike, chances are, if you've got a spread on, the long option is gaining in value, chances are, and the short option is decreasing in value. And, you know, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit with this diagonal. But big picture concepts, you know, you're going to be short an option, that's the target of the stock at expiration if, in, if in fact, you plan to, you know, hold the position to expiration. But without fail, we think in terms of forecast targets, your short options, boom, that's where I want the stock at expiration, at my short strike. Okay? So that's super important, super basic, super important. Long call diagonal. So we're long the Jan 80 call. We're short the Nov 90. All right. You know, as I say, I, I got this into the sideways market. There's some delta in this spread. That 80 call certainly has more value than the 90 call. We agree? So with that, again, the point is, you know, how do we take some money out of the marketplace? So um, the vertical spread would be either Nov, Nov, Jan, Jan. Here we're diagonal. And generally, you're buying, as I say, the in the money or at the money, and then selling either the at the money or the out of the money. All right? What do we have here? We got uh, buying, a, buying the uh, Jan 80 call, selling the Nov 90s. Okay, the debit is 709. 709. What's the maximum value of that spread or close to it is going to be around $10. Agreed? Because of the difference of the strikes. It's going to be more than that because we have different months, but that gives you an idea of things. All right. So again, the price of the stock in the example, you know, doesn't matter until we get to expiration. Because at expiration, it's, you know, where we can figure out whether the 90s have any value and how much do the 80s have. Okay. It is a spread where we are looking clearly for the underlying to go to that short strike. We go with that. And, you know, here's how it looks. You can see to the downside, we've got a seven, I'll just round off, we got a $7 debit for this spread. We've got 700 bucks of risk. And that risk is to the downside. Our maximum profit in the 80, 90 vertical is what price on the underlying? Maximum profit, what price? What strike are we short? I hear 90. We're short the 90 strike. That's where our maximum profit is going to come in. Because that 80 call with the stock at 90, okay, let's go through the numbers. The 80 call with the stock at 90. Now, we were November, January. Agreed? So let's talk November expiration. Stock goes to 90. What's the 80 call worth? 80 call, the right to buy stock at 80 with the stock at 90 is worth $10, right? Plus, we're in November. We're long the Jan. So $10 plus time premium of two months. Agreed? So let's say it's a buck. So that call is now worth 11 bucks. And, you know, if the stock went out at 90, let's say went out at, you know, we, we hit the home run, all right? It, it goes out at 89.99. Calls are out of the money by a penny, all right? So the call is worth nothing. The spread we paid 709 for is now worth what? 11 bucks, okay? That's, you know, that, that's why the, the little point is at 90. And then you certainly have something to manage. You're long an $11 call. So you either sell it, take a profit, you sell, you know, something else. But that's, that's kind of the next step. But back to that big picture, you know, always the case, at expiration, you want the stock at the short strike. 
Uh, let's see. Okay, we kind of went, went through that jazz, you know, just in terms of there is some management involved at expiration. Of course, the maximum loss, you know, nobody likes putting on a $7 debit spread and having it go out at zero. So obviously that's not the game. Hopefully, you know, with an 80, 90 diagonal, we're looking for that stock. It doesn't necessarily have to go all the way to 90, but, you know, we want it going you know, in that direction, if we've got a $7 debit spread on, hopefully we've got a strategy in place, like Alice talked about, that plan where at some point, okay, I'm wrong, I'm out. And you're out either close the position, you roll, whatever the case may be. But have that plan so you're not losing 700 bucks for every spread. Um, so, you know, these are just, of course, the things that go into it. You know, your forecast, obviously, you want to make money. Prices back to that issue of liquidity. Stay away from illiquid issues, please. Um, you know, what if we're assigned? What if the stock goes out at 90.01 instead of 89.99? We get assigned, and, and we don't manage it. You know, that's not why we put the spread on to get belong the $11 call and short the stock, because that's, you know, different risk parameter, different margins. So bottom line is, you know, manage it so you don't get assigned. You didn't put the position on to have a short stock position. So, um, and if I let the short leg expire, we talked about it, just make sure, you know, you're not just naked long an $11 call. Do something against that. Again, if the stock moves against me, have a position in place so that $7 debit doesn't go to zero, ideally. So that's the diagonal. It is a little different, certainly, than just a sideways play, but I, I wanted to get it in there to hammer home this idea of short strike, you know, is where you want that stock to be at expiration. Al, I'll turn it over to you for, I think, our last concept, right? Last, last concept. They were okay. popular. Another strange name it should be a rock and roll group, um, the Iron Butterfly on that. Before we get started with that, and Joe's hitting it towards the end, real quick, spread management techniques. And I'm talking about getting in and getting out here. We're talking about different varieties and variations on a theme for doing spreads for markets. Let's, let's talk for a second about, I'm sitting here and I want to do this. I want to put this spread in. How do I want to do it? Or I want to get out of it, which is maybe even more important on that type of thing. So in the olden days, to a degree, you had to go in with two separate orders, one to buy, one to sell, for the prices or at the prices you wanted to do to put your spread together. And you could have significant movement by the time you hit the, sent the buy in and sent the sell in to do that. Okay. First step, if you have to do that for a spread and put it in that way, buy it first, sell it last. Because the most risk you're going to have is going to be on the sell side. Irregardless, if you don't get the buy side off, you're like, uh-oh. What are we going to do? You'd like to be able to do them simultaneously. You can look at bid offers. And if you look at, I'm going to buy it at this, I'm looking at the offer, I'm going to sell, it, sell this option, I'll, I'll look at the bid, and I'll put in the prices at that. That basically difference in the industry would be called the natural, that you want to do that. In today's world, and this is something to check with your broker and stuff, the ability to enter a spread as a single order and execute it within your parameters, a specific debit or a specific credit for a specific number of contracts, is becoming more and more available. And at the exchanges, they maintain specific books, just like we looked at the bid and offers on, that, on XYZ, we could have a book on a vertical spread of the July's 85's, August 85's, you could have it's bid, I'm willing to buy that spread, put that spread in from the long side for three. Someone else could put in and say, you know what, I like that spread, but I want to sell it at 310. And you could have a spread market you can see and deal with. And that will simultaneously, if it's executed, both sides of the trade. The other side of it is getting out of a trade, always close out your short side first on a spread. Always, if you're closing out the position, Close out that short side. Once again, the same thing holds true. That's your biggest risk. Close out the short, get that out of the way, and then close out the long position. 
because you're taking your biggest risk factor off the table. All right, the iron butterfly consists of the short straddle. Touched on that actually earlier in the day. On that, we're selling a call and we're selling a put. It'll be the same underlying, same expiration date, and the same strike price. Typically, on the straddle trade, it is the at-the-money options that we sell. So a call, sell a put. We've straddled the market. All right? So we have an 85-85 here. You can see that. We can take advantage of a stagnant marketplace and or declining implied volatility. Remember I mentioned declining volatility prices come in. Option prices will come in, both the calls and the puts. We sold to, we took in income. That's why stagnant marketplace, they're not going to change very much as we move towards expiration. And volatility will be down at stagnant if it comes in on that. See the big word, the capitalized word? Unlimited risk. We've got unlimited risk on both sides. If the stock tanks, we got it on that side. And if the stock blows up to the up, we're like, uh-oh. So if the stock blows up, we've got some serious issues on this one. We're looking for, again, limited reward. We've done taken in cash. We're looking for time decay. And of course, there's always in any of these type things, particularly short options in, in this scenario, the risk of assignment. Income would be your motivation, 87.50, XYZ, unchanged. Implied volatility, we're looking for it to come in over the next day. We do the two, sell the call, sell the put, 87.50, 45 days out. We have a net credit of $4 for this for each option that we do. Maximum gain is four. Our maximum risk, we're short two options. The margin example, exchange minimum, you need to work with your broker on that. They, all have, they can modify the minimums that have been put out by, I believe, the OCC on, on requirements on options like that. Two break-evens, because we're down calls and puts. So we've got a break-even on the call side, break-even on the put side. The diagram shows it well. We have the opportunity between those on the top part to pick up some profitability in this. If we hit direct dead center, anybody want to think the odds are that? And most of the time, we hit our maximum, but we've got a little left and right boundary from it. But we do need a decline. All right, let's flip to the other side and change our modus a little bit and look at the long strangle. Now we're going long and we're going to this really interestingly named strategy called a strangle. The long strangle is profitable if the stock, the underlying stock ETF or whatever makes a sharp move. And I emphasize that. In these cases, in the strangles and in the long straddle side, we need a sharp move in the underlying. Not just the average lollygagging along movement. We need something very good. These are the types of plays you will use when you're not sure, but you think the stock has the potential to move. Earnings announcement coming out, good or bad, but the stock hasn't moved. There's a whole methodology to analysis for a good stock to put this type of trade on. Be that as it may, the baseline trade. Volatility is your big player. We're long two options. What isn't your favorite friend here is time decay theta, your long two options. Now you double down on time decay. Every day we get close to the expiration, you're taking a double bite because we're long a call and long a put. XYZ could be sharply lower or it could be sharply higher. So the issue here is with the call and the put, we're not quite sure where it's going to go. Earnings are coming out or an announcement's coming out, but how's it going to react? Well, this way we can be ready for both, as long as it goes strong. The difference between the straddle and the strangle is the expiration, the strike prices that we pick. We got January calls and puts. If we straddle the market, 
In this case, 8750, we don't have it up here, but the 85 would be, let's say, our closest. We would do both 85s. In the strangle, we're going to do the 9085. Cost is 250 to put this on. Maximum gain, basically unlimited, offset by the change on the other side. The put goes up, the call goes down, et cetera. It's still like that with it comes out, okay? Maximum risk, what we paid to put it on, the debit. And once again, two break-evens. And I think the better thing is the illustration on this. This is, uh, Joe had mentioned earlier, and I agree. The more you get used to looking at these things, the more intuitive they get to see where, you, where your position is. Rather than just doing the numbers, the visual might help a little bit better with this. Now remember, when we talked about the straddle before, we came to a point, and our point was right here for our maximum. This has got the lower piece. And if I put this, it over it, we have a sharp point now. What you're getting is because we've moved those strikes, is we're getting a wider range to be successful. However, what we've done is truncated the amount we can be successful. No free lunch. So we give up some to get some with the market straddle. And chances are, because of the prices, it's cheaper to do than the at the monies at the same time. So real quick, let's do the iron butterfly. Because we're going to take a short straddle and a long strangle, and we're going to shove them together. That's a lot of what we've been doing today. That's a lot of what this what the options in the spread environment is, is taking strategies and putting them together. Bear call spread, bull put spread, range bound sideways trading. The options expire worthless and keep the premium income. In this case, 45 day strangle, 87.50. At four, we buy the strangle for 250. Maximum gain. Maximum risk. Margin, once again, check with your broker to see what that would be. And again, 86, 89, we're going to have two break-evens to look at. The big deal, again, we've got to be in that middle. We've got to hit that sweet spot to really pick up the maximum profit. There's a little left and right room inside of that if we get to expiration with the underlying stock on either side of that, but the maximum is a little bit more difficult to pick up on that. Last part of this, <laughs> we got a couple of visuals. Why not compare these two? Because everybody, and these are, are popular strategies. They've, they've come into their own, if you will, with people using them. My caution, as always, with folks new, let's practice. Let's make sure we actually understand the rights and obligations we do when we do this. Let's practice and see how the numbers play out. You know, let's make sure we've got this idea down and our forecast down that we try to overlay this particular strategy. You also have, with your broker, multiple commissions. We've got four options going down here. So we need to factor that in. We haven't really touched on that, but remember, there's a commission factor and then there's taxation somewhere out there as an issue that you need to kind of have, a, have part of your plan, have that thought process in there, particularly the commissions. That directly impacts your bottom line. So where does that take off? I'm going to make 150, but it cost me 85 in commissions and just taking a number. Well, maybe we're not going to do that kind of thing. Anyway, there you go. Iron butterfly, iron condor. Make more with the butterfly if we hit the target. Make a little less on the condor, but we got a wider range for success. And that really kind of sums it up in a nutshell, the difference between these two strategies. So where's your forecast? How comfortable are you with your forecast? And the other analysis. How much is it going to cost? What are we going to put this on for? What do we need to do? So. Which offers the greatest risk versus reward? Which offers the greatest likelihood of success? Well, we could sit here and debate that, I'm sure, back and forth for quite some time. Because as often in options, there's no absolute answer. There's no like, if this happens, you've got to do that type thing. It's up to you, your risk tolerance, and what are your expectations on putting this trade on for the underlying? What am I looking to do? Is this the trade I want to do it? I'm more comfortable with this because there's less risk involved, however that plays out. 
This little chart will give you some picture of it. The iron butterfly, the profit potential is higher. The iron condor is a little bit lower. The maximum loss, the iron condor is higher. The iron butterfly is lower. The trading range to get to that profit potential is certainly more narrow in the butterfly. And you've got that wider range on the condor to look at it, type that. And your exposure to implied volatility puts you short vol implied volatility, which means you need to, have to keep an eye on the changing volatility type thing. So we're short. We want volatility to calm you a little bit. So with that, my past assessment, the man from OIC. I just want to over. thank everybody for you know spending your morning part of your afternoon. It's our privilege, honestly, uh, to be funded by the OCC. Thank you. And don't forget, you know, June 27th, we are going to do that four-part 